All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network Speed Networking Webinar Series. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the North Central Region Water Network, we are a 12-state extension-led collaboration dedicated to ensuring safe and sufficient water supplies across the North Central Region of the United States and beyond. Uh, this is the current webinar series. It's our speed networking webinar series. So we feature two to three presentations around a central theme. And uh, this month, I'm very excited to be talking about precision conservation and uh, discussing two different decision support tools. Uh, a couple uh, items for you in terms of housekeeping for today's webinar. Um, the first is that we are going to be having two presenters today, and we will be having some dedicated Q&A after each of their presentations, um, excuse me, after both presentations. Um, so please submit your questions for the presenters in the Q&A panel. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can note who your question is for. You can also upvote other questions. So if you see someone has a question that you also have or you think is in, uh, particularly interesting, please upvote that. We'll try to take those questions that are most upvoted first in case we run out of time for questions at the end. Um, we also have a chat feature in the Zoom webinar. Uh, the chat feature is really for discussion among um, participants and, and with our hosts and panelists. So uh, we are only sharing some links via that. Um, we'll put the link to our webinar archive there where you can view the recording of this presentation. Um, but it's also an opportunity where we can put the, the link to the ACPF website um, and to the MSU uh, Precision Conservation Tool there. Um, but please don't list your questions for the speakers in that icon. Make sure to uh, put your questions for our speakers today in the Q&A icon to ensure that we uh, we see them when we're doing the facilitated Q&A. Also, if you're having any audio issues, you can use the phone in option uh, that can be accessed by clicking the up arrow on the mute icon at the bottom of your screen and then clicking switch to phone audio. This session is recorded today, and we'll post the recording to today's session on our website, northcentralwater.org, and our webinar archive, where you can find all of our webinars dating back to 2014, and I'll put the link for that in the chat for folks. All right, so let's uh, dive in and get, side and get started. This is our last of the current webinar series of 2022, and I'm excited for a great topic today. And we have two great speakers, uh, Jessica Nelson from Iowa State University, who's gonna be discussing the Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework, and Mark McConnell from Mississippi State University, who's gonna be talking about MSU's Precision Conservation Tool. Uh, so very excited to talk about both of these. I've had the opportunity to work uh, with the uh, Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework team or ACPF team for a little while. And I don't know about you, but I've heard about uh, Mark's uh, precision conservation tool, I feel like for several years. And so I think ACPF is kind of similar. Folks hear a lot about it, but we're um, interested to see how it might be able to better, better benefit our work as frontline and ag. Uh, and natural resource professionals and how we can help uh, producers and landowners make some informed decisions about conservation on their land. All right. Well, uh, jumping in, our first presenter is Jessica Nelson. I won't read her uh, full bio here, but Jessica Nelson um, is a graduate student currently at Iowa State University um, and has been involved with ACPF and using ACPF for uh, a number of years here from her time in Iowa as well in Minnesota. So I'll let you read, um, read her bio there. Uh, we're really excited to have her here talking about the ACPF, the Agricultural Conservation Plan planning framework, as well as the new uh, tool on the ACPF, uh, they're deeming FinArt, the Financial and Nutrient Reduction Tool. So with that, Jessica, I will hand it off to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Anne. Let's see. Let's screen. Can you see my screen? All right. Can you see that okay? Looks great. Hello, everyone in the virtual world. Uh, good to thanks for participating today and hearing a little bit about what Mark and I are working on in our parts of the nation. Um, like Ann said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the agricultural conservation planning framework and kind of some ways it can be used for development of land management scenarios based off of your resource concerns um, using this tool. 
So for a little introduction or kind of background on what the ACPF is for those who are new to it or have heard about it but not so familiar, um, it's ACPF stands for Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework, and it's kind of three parts. It's a planning concept, and so the focus of this concept or the foundation um, that the developers had is building. So health is an important part of it, and that's kind of the foundation of a productive landscape is having soil that can support that crop. Um, and so we want to protect the soil from erosion, we want to limit excess nutrients, and we want to help maintain good structure and building soil organic matter. Um, and then as we build on our soils, looking at opportunities to control water within fields um, via controlled drainage, waterways, filter strips, um, water and sediment control basins or waskobs, and then also controlling water below fields, um, so using impoundments, like nutrient removal wetlands, um, and depressional areas, and then kind of our last line of a defense before water runoff gets into our surface waters is riparian management and looking at ways to enhance our um, filter strips along ditch systems and riverine areas. And then on top of a planning concept, the ACPF is also a geo database that can be used in um, ArcMap or the Esri world. And so when you're working with the ACPF, and if it's available within your area, are able to download this geo database from the ACPF for Watersheds website, which is the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, and with it, you'll get a HUC 12 watershed boundary, um, cropping history within that watershed and all the field boundaries, as well as um, soils data from the DSERGO, uh, nice and tidily packaged up. Um, and then also uh, crop cropland data layers all the way back to 2010. Um, and then and kind of this is the what we use when we're doing an analysis in GIS using the ACPF to kind of achieve some of those planning concepts. Um, and then ACPF is also a GIS toolbox. Um, there's a set of tools in here involving kind of DEM preparation. So preparing your digital elevation layer. Uh, so the water flow paths are moving appropriately and we can really target at a field scale um, and develop a perennial stream network. So we are kind of optimizing our locations for uh, riparian buffer zones. And then um, I just have kind of the, the BMPs that are within the tool expanded out in the tool set. And so there's uh, precision conservation practice siting. Um, Within that is depressions, drainage water management, grass waterways, contour buffer strips, bioreactors, and then impoundments. Uh, you can kind of just read down wetlands and wash scobs, and then also a whole area for riparian assessments. Um, so this is kind of my soapbox for me, and the importance of that initial step for why DM preparation is important is a lot of times our data layers that we get from um, our vendors don't necessarily have these culverts cut through. And so we get digital dams and our stream networks end up flowing kind of wonky. And so we need to take these additional steps to put in the culvert and make sure our surface flow paths are moving appropriately so we can really target at the field scale um, and be a little more precise when we're developing these um, land management scenarios. So that's just one of my little soapbox topics. And uh, we can move on from here. So uh, where can I work with the ACPF uh, as a planning, planning concept? You can work with it anywhere agriculture is happening. Um, soil, healthy soils is good for everywhere. As a geodatabase, there's prepared geodatabases available in several states. Everywhere these kind of pink purple lines are, they're HUC8 watershed boundaries, and that's where pre-made databases are already available. Um, and then as a GIS toolbox, ACPF can be applied anywhere. Uh, in the US and there's uh, utilities within the toolbox that you can kind of create your own base geo database. So if you're somewhere in North Dakota or um, Kentucky or wherever, you're able to kind of build one of your own um, base geo databases to use within the toolbox. And so you just need to have access to a watershed boundary, um, field boundaries, and there's information on helping to develop those or finding it. And also GSERGO, NAS, and digital elevation model. Uh, we typically recommend using a three meter if possible, but um, there's ways uh, people use other things based on what's available. 
Um, so as uh, Mark Tomer would always describe it when he gives these presentations, the ACPF is a planning tool and it gives you a menu of options that you can do um, or pursue within your area of interest. Um, and so here's just kind of an example of what this menu looks like. And this is a practice sightings within East Central Iowa. It's kind of an overwhelming looking menu. So these are all the potential and some of them might be existing conservation practices. For those who don't wanna look at that map, it's kind of psychedelic. Here's just a list of some of the practices that are listed in there. There's bioreactor opportunities, saturated buffers, depressions um, for wetland restorations and farm ponds, nutrient removal wetlands. I kind of separated out the contour buffer strips from anything less than 10% mean slope. And so it would be maybe a contour filter strip to greater to 10, which means that field might be more suitable for kerosene. Um, and then just some of the recommended riparian buffer vegetation is on the far right in the bottom corner there. Um, so from that map, here's just kind of a summary of those practice sightings, uh, approximately 29 bioreactors. This is a pretty well incised landscape, so not a lot of opportunities for drainage water management because it's not um, estimated to be a heavily piled area. So it's about 39% of the um, stream miles could have a saturated buffer on there, and about in addition, 2% of those with a carbon enhancement had cited. 82 nutrient removal wetlands, seven farm ponds, um, a lot of possibilities, which is kind of exciting, but also overwhelming. So it's, where do you go from there? Um, it's kind of the question is, so what should we choose from the ACPF menu? And that's really based off of what your watershed's needs are or kind of the diet you want um, that you need for it. And so are you prioritizing nutrient reductions, um, reducing sediments, increasing wildlife habitat, or trying to reduce flooding. Uh, there's been some additional resources for the ACPF to complement it for once you get those outputs, how to um, prioritize. And so currently um, available add-ons is this tool called FineArt, which stands for Financial and Nutrient Reduction Tool, which attaches the practice cost data for ACPF outputs and estimates nitrate reductions. It's limited to Minnesota and Iowa right now, but um, has the opportunity to be expanded to other states, depending on interest. Um, and then in development currently is tools to identify chronically unprofitable fields, uh, support reconnecting floodplains within the river for flood mitigation, and then attaching financial costs with phosphorus and sediment reductions. There's also a whole slew of case studies and examples on the ACPF website um, where you can see people using this in action and some of the sub watershed analyses um, and reports that have been produced and some one-on-one -on -one engagement with farmers to actually implement these practices. Um, so there's some links and you can also find it on the ACPF for Watersheds website. I'm gonna go into a little example using that fine art tool of what I'm currently working on. Uh, our goal is to increase grasses in our watershed of interest um, that can be used as biofuels and that also provide wildlife, water quality, and carbon sequestration benefits. So this is just kind of an overview of the digital elevation model of the watershed. Um, and here's kind of a run through of what current existing practices that are um, grass related that have been uh, digitized for this watershed. And so about 0.7 acres, are in prairie strips currently. There's 626 acres of riparian buffer. Um, and we estimate about 731 acres of this. It's a total of 36,000 acre watershed um, is using cover crops. And so that's about 3.7% of the watershed is in some sort of grass that could be harvested for a biofuel. Um, and then we estimate to maintain have implemented and maintained these conservation practices. It's about 193,000 per year. Um, and that we're currently getting about a 13.2% nitrate and reduction to our surface waterways. Um, and assuming if there was no existing conservation practices. And so our question is kind of how can we continue to reduce the amount of nitrogen um, and get all these other ecological benefits and uh, the bottom two rows within this table are a little bit about 
carbon uh, sequestration, there's kind of total tons of carbon being reduced and the amount of biomass produced. And this is not a part of ACTF, it's just a side calculation that we were um, conducting for some of those additional questions we have. And so now with ACTF, these are all outputs from ACTF that I'm showing you on this next map. And these are the potential scenarios. And so existing conditions, we're assuming there's 2% of this watershed, which is the kind of dark red, brown patched fields have cover crops in it. And uh, with ACPF, we kind of we were able to identify all the existing croplands and what 20% of this watershed would look like with cover crops and what 100% of this watershed would look like with cover crops. And then plug that into the um, fine arts calculator with our your ACPF outputs and put it into fine art and then estimate how much additional cost could this um, take landowners and the watersheds to um, realize these actions on the field. And so now we have, assuming 100% of crop fields are now planted with cover crop or include cover crop, um, that's about 65.7% of the watershed increase in grass cover overall. Um, and then uh, we now have a 20.2% reduction in nitrogen. Um, and so total nitrate reduction in pounds and kind of get cost effectiveness with fine arts and those carbon and biomass values are um, again, calculated outside of ACPF. And another scenario we're looking at is not only harvesting cover crops, but can we harvest um, prairie vegetation as a, a feedstock for these biofuel systems. And so using the contour buffer strip outputs, um, looking at what a 30 foot prairie strip scenario would look like on some of those more vulnerable hill slopes. And so we targeted fields that had a mean slope greater than 5% and looked at what a 30 foot prairie strip would look like or a 120 foot swath of prairie strip. And um, here on this table, just showing kind of what the 120 foot prairie strip would be. And so that now um, 3,314 corn bean fields would be converted to that um, prairie vegetation and used in the, the feedstock system and harvested. Um, and so, yeah, you can just look again at some of the grass cover, some of the total cost per year going down the line are nitrogen or nitrate and reduction percent, how many pounds, cost effectiveness per pound. And all of these are reported mean values um, and also some of the carbon and biomass values. And just kind of wanted to highlight some other work that we'll be incorporating into the study. That'll be a tool that's available is identifying chronically unprofitable land for conservation. Um, Haley Summers has been developing this tool and it just goes within a watershed and looks at, in Iowa, we have this corn suitability rating that um, helps us with some of these analyses and anything within this watershed, anything that had a CSR rating below 72 um, was not, was profitable and more unprofitable in more years than it was profitable. And so that's just highlighted in the pink and that's another targeting tool to help prioritize um, some, alternative ways to get be productive and keep farms productive by getting some a different crop on the landscape. I think this popped up. And uh, with that, I suppose I can't take questions now, but that's kind of some of the ways we've been using ACPF and just a brief introduction to it. And here's some contact information. John Tyndall um, has been working with students on developing the tools I presented today for several years and he's, yeah, no information and Rick Cruz has been a point of contact on this project with us all. I'll stop sharing here. Lovely, thank you so much, Jessica. All right, well, um, so I, I really appreciate that presentation and a little bit of an overview of ACPF and what it can do, the types of questions that it can help us answer as uh, conservation and watershed professionals. And I think it was a great transition, especially there at the end when you're talking about those lands that may not be profitable 
um, or you know, marginal lands sometimes we, we classify them, right? When does it make sense to take those out of production and potentially put them into um, a conservation easement? And so I know um, that is one of the questions or you know, one of the concepts that uh, Mark McConnell's um, MSU precision conservation tool is really aiming at getting at. And again, kind of uh, leveraging that economic data that we know so many producers really are keen to get before making some of these decisions. So excited to have Mark here and talking about his precision conservation tool. I won't read his full bio here, um, but I will just take a minute there and um, pass it off to you, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can get this thing to share correctly. Does that look right? Looks great. Okay. Man, the share bar really is in the way. Oh, I can move it. Okay. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in today and giving me a few minutes. Uh, that was really probably the best setup I've ever had in a, in a, in a meeting where somebody kind of teased me up for what I'm going to talk about. So we should really consider presenting more often together. Um, for the last 15 years or so, I've been working on precision agriculture to find a way to more strategically enroll uh, conservation and full disclosure, you know, if you saw my bio, I'm a wildlife biologist. I, I, that, that is what I'm trained in. And I really have no business being in precision agriculture. It just kind of happened. And it's become a huge part of my research program and my career. Um, so I'm going to describe to you the decision support tool that we've developed and kind of the logic behind it. Um, and what we've done is what we call this economically targeted conservation delivery and I'll, I'll go into a little further detail with that as I get into it. And I just want to acknowledge uh, my research associate, Ryan Mann, who put together a lot of this material. And he worked, he uses my software around the around the state of Mississippi on a daily basis with, with private uh, landowners. So um, if this thing will advance slide. There we go. Oh, it's going too fast now. Okay, so... <clears throat> Targeted conservation, like, so I, what I'm going to talk about is economically targeted conservation, but targeted conservation is nothing really new. Uh, and uh, the primary focus of, of this software we've done is, is, is operating within the Conservation Reserve Program. And CRP, since uh, its kind of official inception in the 1985 Farm Bill, has always targeted conservation, typically through the HEL, highly erodible land criteria that uh, 33 and a third percent of fields had to be designated as to qualify for CRP. And but it doesn't have to be just based off soil. But what's interesting is we all, if you work in agricultural systems, you know there's parts of almost every row, field, row crop field that are traditionally lower in profitability. They have lower yields for a myriad of reasons. It could be either flood prone, there's too much a different soil issue there, uh, could be comp competition with the adjacent plant community. There's a host of issues. And these issues, these areas are typically, you know, lower in revenue generation. And there was a great uh, paper published by David Muth in 2014 in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation, or Joel and Soil and Water Conservation, that showed that fields that typically have lower organic matter, matter, lower, um, higher saline issues, more sand, anything like that, they tend to be the fields that have parts of the field that have lower yield. They're more uh, a factor in nitrogen leaching. They cause a whole suite of environmental challenges. And they actually reduce revenue for that area and for the whole field. So we wanted to figure out a way to capture where these areas were in a very simplistic approach and, and try to find out if we can match those with conservation practices in the farm bill to increase the profitability of the entire field, not just the problematic areas. And when you get more increased hopefully profitability, we've got research that has shown that you get more ecosystem services. One of those ecosystem services being the focus of my career, which is increased uh, wildlife habitat. So we felt like there was this gap between what the conservation community, at least in the wildlife profession, wanted farmers to do and what farmers really could do, or if they could even make an informed decision based off, okay, let's say I take that land out of production. What is the economic outcome of that? So we wanted to find a way to integrate conservation into working landscapes in an economically profitable manner. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Conservation Reserve Program, there's about 40 different practices in the current 2008 Farm Bill. 
that are operate under uh, CRP. And the, the way the USDA and RCS manual reads is that they're supposed to be delivered in an objective driven approach. And the objective should be at the forefront, be the landowner's objective, what they, he or she want with that, 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 that property. So it could be, you know, grasslands, which is very popular now, pollinator habitat, which is a huge, huge hot button issue, creation of wetlands, any of these things you can, you can design an enrollment to meet these natural resource objectives. And there's enough flexibility in the farm bill to, to allow that. And, but each one of these practices here, and I don't even have them all here. I, I probably need to update that, that graph, that picture. Um, they all have different spatial requirements, different payment options, different uh, where they fit on a farm, if they're adjacent to a water course, if they're not, how wide they can be, how, you know, there's all these different things. And if you, if you, if you're like me and you read the actual programmatic language in the farm bill, um, then I feel sorry for you because it's, it's a, it's a tough life, but it's also hard to expect landowners to understand all that and have to keep up with every five years that stuff being changed. So we wanted to find a way to kind of facilitate objective driven conservation via the farm bill programs and in a way that actually let the farmers farm their best ground and uh, find where they can make more money in conservation. So to do that, the first set of tools we need is uh, yield maps or, or yield monitors that we get. And that's yield monitors and yield maps are one of the many uh, tools within the arsenal of precision agricultural technology. And most combines for the last decade have come, come standard with yield monitor technology. If you haven't been in a in a, in a combine over the last several years or any tractor really, but especially a combine, there's an onboard computing system. There's about three screens that are going off. So farmers have this ability to really spatially understand how multiple inputs and how, how spatially variable inputs uh, affect their, their, their field. And they can see where their lower yields or higher yields are. And they can see kind of the magnitude of those. So we were like, all right, great. We know these parts of these fields exist. Let's find a way to target these, these areas that are challenging, either from an environmental standpoint, but often also as from an economic standpoint. And let's see if we can create a program that allows farmers to visualize where these different conservation practices might fit on their property and visualize what, what would happen economically if they were to take that land out of production and enroll it in something that is subsidized um, under the farm bill. So uh, one of the the conservation opportunities in the farm bill have are well known. They're well published. It's incredibly I, most farmers tend to understand that. What we don't think has been terribly well uh, articulated to the farming community is the economic opportunities in the farm bill. So our rule is, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. Uh, no one in my research program will recommend a conservation enrollment unless it increases profitability. Now I've taken some flack from this in the wildlife community for for having such a hard line on that and. You know, in, in part of my brain, yes, enroll maximum conservation, and that'd be the greatest thing in the world. And I and I definitely agree that there's there's some logic to that. But farmers are driven by economics, and they need to be able to to increase and optimize the profitability on each and every field and each and every acre of every field. And we found that the more we tend to have them put economics at the forefront of their decision making. Uh, the ancillary benefits we get from wildlife and probably from water quality as well. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say they're secondary, but to, to, in a farmer's mind, often they are, and we, we want to meet them where they're at. So we want to be able to have, uh, find that overlap between the economic and environmental uh, opportunities and find a way to implement that in a, in a, in a conservation friendly scenario. So this, these, these profit maps at the bottom here, this is an analysis I did for some waterfowl uh, people several years ago using our software. This is a field that had a lot of yield problems, uh, profit problems. These are profit maps. They've been converted. And you can see in the in the south, uh, I guess that would be the southwest corner of the field, it's a really low area. Some years it flooded. On those years, yield was garbage. On years where it was really dry, those areas stayed a little more moist. Bumper crops, right? But on average, this is in the Mississippi Delta uh, or the Alluvial Valley, which for some reason we call the Delta in Mississippi. And they were losing money more years than not. So we ran a scenario where we looked at what if they took that low yielding area that was flood prone out and rolled it in conservation practice 23, which is a, a wetlands practice that has a certain buffer uh, ratio around it. And then we simulated the economics of that practice, where it would go, and then looked at how it would shift, if it would shift revenue across that field. And we were able to demonstrate a small uh, uh, increase in revenue across that field uh, with, that, with that change. And it was one of those things where we would have liked that to be a larger margin of, of difference. 
but as you can see, there were a lot of other yield issues uh, on that field that the farmer was not interested in, in looking at. So just a way to kind of chip away at a field and make it a little, uh, a little more profitable. So to do all this, we used to do it in RGIS, and that was it took about 562 clicks to, to run through a scenario. And that's what I did for my master's. And we decided that was no one's ever going to do that, nor should they have to. So we, we kind of built the software to kind of have some of that stuff happen behind the scenes. And the first thing the software we call it the Mississippi State Precision Conservation Tool. It's copyrighted, should be available by the end of the year. Um, the, well, the first thing it does is it illustrates, it draws on an aerial photograph file, shape files that demonstrate where certain conservation practices are eligible. So if it's a riparian, uh, she mentioned riparian buffer practices, right? There's a, there's, there's a number of those uh, that, that farmers can enroll in. Um, and we want to make sure some of them, some of them have different criteria, spatial criteria. We wanted to be able to visualize that on the field. Um, then if the farmer has yield data, which they give to us, then we can generate a series of scenarios that help illustrate where the economic outcomes of those conservation scenarios. And in this little uh, graphic over here to the right, the, the first panel is what the profit map was with just production. You've got some definite, definite uh, profit loss there on the field margins. The, the second option there is a, is a, a very targeted strategic conservation enrollment. The th number three there is profit service when you maximize conservation. And the fourth one there is if you just enroll the stuff outlined in number two, what does the profit surface look like uh, when you do it more strategically? And I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a little bit. So what I'm going to do now is, is watch you walk you through a video here. This is the software. I'll pause this real quick. Um, the software now is an is a EXE file you just download on your computer. It comes with a bunch of stuff in it. You don't require a GIS license or anything like that. And it's just a GUI. It's just a graphical user interface where the the we we expect folks like y'all or a private consultant or a farm bill biologist or somebody to sit down with a farmer and work through this. So you start by loading an aerial map, and then you uh, <clears throat> did I push play? Nope, I didn't. There you go. Hello, everyone. Welcome oh. to another video using the MSU Precision Conservation. I don't want to hear that guy talk. That's my research associate. But I want to. Um, Make sure this video is working. Y'all bear with me. Video. The sound was not supposed to be on for this. <laughs> okay, so um, you've got your options over here for enrolling, all the inputs you've got to put into it. You've got, um, and you come here, you load an aerial photograph. And then you come over and you pick your conservation practice. So all the different conservation practices, y'all bear with me. It's um, it's playing the wrong video here. And I ran through this <laughs> a number of times. Okay, now we're back on track. I'm going to get us off schedule here. Um, you pick your aerial photograph. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Then you come over and you pick your conservation practice. All the conservation practices in the farm bill are built into this with all their payment information and spatial criteria. You uh, tell it you want to compute profitability, and then you uh, add some data to it. And this is just field boundary data, right? So this is just shape files that you can get from the landowner or from NRCS, or if you have your own, it automatically zooms into them. You tell it which state you're in. So this is Mississippi, and I believe it is uh, Humphreys County. And that's going to take the sole rental right information. And then we're going to tell it which buffer width we want to simulate. So for this one, we're going to do a CP33 analysis with 30, 80, and 120 foot buffers. Um, we're going to add now add our yield data. And in this case, we want the farmer to uh, have as much yield data as they can. You can add as many years as possible. And you can uh, put as many, the more the merrier. We want to capture that variation from year to year. So this is going to be some corn data. You can tell it the commodity price you want to simulate. Uh, that way farmers can, you know, pick you know, where that break even point is, their production cost gets entered, and then you just tell it which file uh, is the yield data, and you add it, and it takes um, it takes a couple seconds to add. In this case, uh, we're going to add a couple of years of corn data just so we can capture some of the variability, but you can add corn and soybean, any rotation, it doesn't matter. It's going to create a profit surface based off the input cost and everything else uh, and build that for you. And so this is two years of corn data. And then as soon as you, you click OK and tell it uh, you're done, it's going to zoom into the field and show you those yield files. 
takes it about five or six seconds. It used to be much longer. <laughs> so those are those yield data files right there. We we can symbolize those with different colors, but no need. We're gonna we're gonna gonna skip to another step. But there they are over on the table of contents on the left. Now we're going to come in and say, okay, for this conservation practice, what are the establishment costs? You can get that from NRCS. Um, what are the maintenance uh, costs? We're going to um, we're going to pick our raster cell size. This just helps with visualization, and we're going to tell it to run that scenario. And all you've got to do now is tell it where you want to store it and give it a name. Um, and then it's going to take about, I think, 10 seconds to run this scenario. The more yield data you add, the longer it takes. Give it a second. Now, the first thing it's going to show us here is our profit per acre. It's got a little output. Your profit per acre from original profit and then your profit per acre uh, for 30, 80, and 120 foot buffers. And what you'll see here is it's a profitable field, no doubt about it. But we can actually increase profitability by about 20 to 30 dollars per acre simply by enrolling a fixed buffer width. In this case, of CP33, which is a fairly fairly profitable practice for most most areas because it targets field margins. But what I want you to notice is that that 120 foot buffer we're actually decreasing revenue from from the one before that. And what we we, we want to run those scenarios so we kind of know where that break even spot is in that field. I don't want to take out good ground. So I'm as much as as a quail biologist, I would love a 120 foot grass buffer around a field. In this case, an 80 or some odd foot buffer is actually going to increase more revenue. And I'm willing to sacrifice that extra acreage for the farmer to, to be to be more profitable. Um, so you, you kind of look at those, just kind of gives you kind of the 30,000 foot view of it. Uh, make sure the landowner understands where their options are. And then you can kind of come over and uh, look at the results tab. This is kind of fun. It kind of shows you a bar graph comparison of original profit in red versus CRP enrollment. And then the little histogram on the bottom just shows you kind of the distribution of those profitability across sales. And what you typically see is as we increase conservation to the most part, we're shifting that distribution to the right so that we can see that we're creating more profitable uh, sales across, across the field. And like I said, those outputs tend to just help give the farmer something else to see. Then we come over to the table of contents. You can turn off some of these layers. This is my pride and joy of this software, this CRP profit layer. This is a cell by cell comparison that shows you only where the con conservation is more profitable um, than farming on this field. Now, because it's a cell by cell comparison, it's going to have some spotches in there and things that aren't continuous, and that's fine. I want the landowner to be able to look at that and then design their own buffer um, in the way that is most, most economical for them. So you might not want to bring in some of this stuff over here, you, and, or you might not want to take in all this. It gives them the ability to make an informed decision, and they use this as a way to um, essentially examine how to create a more strategic, more streamlined conservation scenario based off a cell-by-cell -cell comparison. And so you want to look at the farmer and have, have them evaluate this, see if it makes sense to them, and just kind of discuss what they want to do next. Uh, and then as you turn off some of the layers, that's the profit service with a 120-foot buffer. Uh, profit service with an 80 foot buffer. And what you've seen is we've turned those red areas green. Uh, and then the overall profit is the last one. And what you'll notice is there's a major issue in that northwestern corner. Something's going on there. I don't know what it is, uh, but that's something we want to be able to uh, address more, st more strategically. What I'm going to show you next is um, I got I to gotta mute my research associate here, but um, I want to show you. What if we took that same field and we want to run a scenario uh, again, we just pull out the original profit map that we already had. We don't have to upload all the yield files again. We just go grab that original profit service. It's a TIFF file, upload that. And then let's try a CP42, which is the pollinator practice. Let's run a, a new scenario and just see if we can be more flexible. So CP42, uh, has a different, it doesn't, it, it can be anywhere in a field as long as it's at least a half acre in size, but it does have a higher establishment cost because we're planting, you know, a lot of wildflowers and pollinator things. It has associated maintenance costs as well, but it gives you more flexibility. And what we've done with the tool is we've allowed the, the, the user to design their own conservation uh, scenario here. So you, you tell it your raster cell size you want to run. Uh, that just helps how you visualize it the smaller, the prettier. And then you click draw polygons. And when you get to where you can uh, draw this polygon, 
you can essentially design your own conservation scenario to only take out the portions of the field that you want to. So if you notice, we've got some very distinct red areas here. So we're going to click uh, and kind of just draw where the, we think those begin and end and not take out anything that's not red, because this practice will allow that. Um, so that 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 western border up here and all the way down, you just start clicking and follow that red line as best you can. Doesn't have to be perfect, uh, and it doesn't matter how far off you click; it's going to clip it to the field boundary at the end of the day anyway. So you can be kind of sloppy with it, and uh, as Ryan's doing here, and you click off, double click it, tell it you're done, and it's going to run the exact same profitability comparison, but now it's going to do it uh, for this CP42 practice, which has a different uh, economic incentives, has different spatial requirements. You just tell it where you want to store the output again, give it a name, and then um, hit OK. Same process, takes about eight seconds to run, and we're going to end up with some very similar, uh, some very similar stuff here. We've got, OK, we've got a certain profit uh, profitability with the uh, farming alone, and then just by taking out all that red and nothing else, we've essentially almost doubled profitability on the field. And some people are going to say that's that's way too crazy of a number. I assure you, we've done this hundreds of times. We don't see a doubling all the time, but we do see it sometimes. And it's uh, it's generally when we can very strategically and economically target the worst ground possible with a conservation practice that pays well. Oh wait, I went too fast there. That's all right. So. In the, I want to kind of wrap up here with uh, a case study to show you. Um, this was an analysis we did in Lowndes County, Mississippi, with about 52 or some odd fields. I can't remember. We just published this in the Journal of Precision Agriculture earlier this year. And the, a lot of fields on this farm, a lot of yield data, several years of yield data, which was great. And the first thing we did was we wanted to say, okay, where can we where all does CP22, the forested riparian buffer, and where all does CP33, the habitat buffers for upland birds practices, fit on this farm? Well, if you give it field boundaries, first, it'll tell you all the CP33 options that are there. And if you have the NHD layer, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, it'll buffer those by the maximum amount within each crop field, and it'll illustrate how many acres are eligible for each conservation practice. But eligibility and profitability are two different things. So we ran a couple of scenarios where we looked at the profitability across the farm of just farming. And then we looked at the profitability across the farm. Uh, if we maxed out conservation, I mean, we put as much CP22 and as much CP33 as we possibly could, regardless of economics, and looked at that across the farm. And then we looked at the economically targeted approach, where we only enrolled it if it increased revenue. And what we found was, and I apologize, this is in uh, dollars per hectare, but that's what these journals require these days. The original profitability was pretty profitable. When you maximize conservation and just do the most conservation that, that you can fit, you actually decrease revenue in this case because you're actually chopping into some really productive ground. But when you do the economically targeted conservation, you're able to actually increase overall revenue against in all those scenarios. OK, so of the 52 fields, 37 of them, we were able to increase revenue, which means and which is good. 71 percent of those fields, there was options for increasing revenue and in some of the fields there were not. Those are good fields. They're well managed. They're doing good. Um, but of those 30. So across all that, all that average increase in profitability was 24 percent. But this is a graph of how that varied across those 37 fields. It varied a lot. Some of them, it was a couple of percent. Some of them, it was over 200 percent. And we put this in the in the paper to illustrate that I probably wouldn't start taking land out of production on these fields. That's a really small margin of difference. I would probably start on this uh, far right end of this graph and work my way down because somewhere in here, and this is something I'd really love to understand, somewhere in here is a farmer's threshold, right? There's a certain amount of revenue they're going to expect before they make a land use change. I don't know what that is, but I feel like this graph, if I can show it to a farmer, it helps them understand um, helps them figure out where their threshold is. The last thing we'll show here is you can actually look at uh, the frequency distribution of all those cells across all the, the, all the fields in the farm. And the gray is row crop normal production and the green is after uh, targeted conservation. And what you'll see is we've shifted the distribution way to the right. There is still some unprofitable ground on this farm. But all this is no longer unprofitable. We've shifted that to the right and made it profitable. That's what these lines here are. And you can't get every acre, but through economically targeted conservation, you can knock a lot of those unprofitable acres out. You can get those in 
uh, uh, hopefully in a subsidized conservation practice, increased revenue for the farmer, increased environmental benefits to everybody. Um, and I don't know if I went over time or under time, but um, I'll stop right there and open it up to questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, great. Yeah, let's dive into some questions here. Um, I know we have some questions both on uh, the precision conservation tool and on the ECPF. All right. So uh, I think one of the first questions is for Jessica about the ACPF. So um, how does the the fine art, I think that's how you're pronouncing it, the, the financial and nutrient reduction tool that was recently added to the ACPF, how does it connect? Is it another GIS tool or how do you connect it to the other databases if it's not produced in ACPF? Uh, Question, Marcel. Um, I'm just going to share my screen real quick and yeah, absolutely. show kind of what my workspace looks like for this. Is that okay? This is an ArcGIS Pro. Um, so the ACPF toolbox looks like this. I showed a screenshot of that, but I didn't show a screenshot of um, fine art itself. And so that's another GIS toolbox. You open up that script and you take all the outputs from the ACPF and input those into here um, within that ARC environment. And then it outputs tables and polygons back into your geo database. Um, there's a couple, there's a tool, two tools, and it um, has all the um, economics built into it and uh, reduction efficiency for nitrogen already. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And I know currently that tool is only available for Iowa and Minnesota. That's where the, you know, the, the base layer, uh, the base data is, but the, the team is working on expanding that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Anne has a question um, for you, Mark. How often are the commodity prices updated in the software in order to determine profitability or do they rely on farmer input? Yeah, we actually don't build those in at all. The when you when you load yield data in, you choose the commodity price you want to look at. Uh, so what farmers typically do is, like when we sit down with them, we say, okay, well, because it's we're looking at yield data we've collected, they've collected the years before. We'll either say, okay, what did you sell for at that year? Uh, or what I really like is, you know, how like I'll, I ask them to go up. I want to see I want to see where that threshold yeah. is in the profit map when they go when they go higher. Um, so a lot of times we'll, I'll, we'll almost like force them. All right, just, just, just run it for, you know, you know, well, what used to, it's hard to know what's a normal number anymore because crop prices are. <laughs> so yeah. I've been doing this for uh, 15 years and the volatility in the corn and soybean market has been, is quite impressive to watch. I can remember when I didn't think you'd ever get past $10 a bushel for soybeans. And man, we've seen that, you know, broken number of times. So yeah, they just click in whatever price they want and then they can run it again at a different price. But I typically encourage them to put it a little higher uh, just on the anticipation that, hey, I'd hate for us to have a boom in the commodity market and then you not be prepared for that, right? So, you know, run it up to $16 a bushel for soybeans. But what also happens is their inputs go up too. And we, tr we really try to focus, encourage farmers to not farm for yield a farm for profit because there's a point where those two start to separate a little bit and uh, they're not perfectly uh, uh, linear. And because a lot of times you've got really, really good yields, but they've also put a lot of money per acre into those. And uh, some of those acres, I would argue, are probably not worth that investment. Um, and they could probably just, the, the analogy I give is like a portfolio management, right? So what's a farmer's most valuable resource is their soil. But imagine not all your souls are created equal, just like not all investments are, are created equal. There are some souls that are inherently more risky than others and risky assets. A portfolio manager is going to ask you to divest in. And so we say is take your risky asset, asset, assets and invest them in something like a conservation program, which I equate to like a... Um, a treasury bond or playing the, <laughs> playing the index, right? They're not going to be crazy, but it's a guaranteed 
predictable payment. Uh, and there's there's that funny story with Warren Buffett and that hedge fund manager. I don't know if y'all heard this story, but they both invested a bunch of money and Warren Buffett played the index and the hedge fund manager did whatever they do. And they were after 10 years, whoever won was going to the other person was have to donate their money to some charity of their choosing. Eight years in, the hedge fund manager conceded because Warren Buffett, just by 5% returns, had already was so far ahead of the game, there was no way the hedge fund manager could, could catch up. So there are some risky souls that some years you're going to get bumper crops out of for one reason or another. But over, a say, a CRP contract, so 10 or 15 years, that guaranteed return without having to put a dime or, or any farming inputs into it is can be real attractive on your riskiest soil. Good question. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard that um, many times within extension, right? Kind of uh, shifting some of what you think about and from productivity to profitability, because um, sometimes you can kind of get on that profitability train um, where you're not you're not like fully looking, take a step and looking back at everything. So that makes a lot of sense, and also great that you can add in your own com commodity prices there to to um, um, play around a little bit. Um, I was shocked to see you were saying double sometimes, which is. Uh, I would not, not have known that without seeing, without have seen in this presentation, I would not have thought double. <laughs> it's not the norm, but it is, it does happen. And those, wow. those, a lot of the yield data I get is from crop consultants around the state who are, you know, they're doing a really good job to manage every, every, you know, these, we didn't cherry pick bad fields, right? We, we yeah. see these patterns, uh, that analysis from Lowndes County was from the largest crop consultant in the state who, he doesn't like to farm bad ground. So there was there were still opportunities within that analysis. Gotcha, gotcha. So Stephanie has a question. Um, she says, you must get that yield information from the farmer themselves. I'm guessing there isn't a state and national database where you can import that information. No, man, that would make my life so easy if there was. Yield data is actually really challenging to get a hold of. You pretty much better have a relationship with the farmer or know somebody with Nutrien or whoever, one of their or Dow or somebody, Monsanto, who, who works with them, who does. Uh, I just got a big external hard drive for a bunch of cotton data from a farmer I've actually never met, but a friend of a friend, you know, was able to get it from him. We're trying to move away from the reliance on the actual yield monitor data because it's so hard to get and try to go with a remote sensing approach. Uh, that requires a lot of calibration because soils and predictable yields are so variable across the country. Um, uh, there are ways to do it. There's been tons of research that has done it, but to do it at a at a very, very a very uh, a very accurate scale like this is, is somewhat challenging with remote sensing. So I've got a postdoc working on that. Um, my goal is in the next couple of years to be completely done with yield monitor data if I can and use purely remote sensing, but that that is challenging. Yeah, absolutely. But if y'all have any, if y'all have any in y'all's part of the world that somebody wants to give, I need something to calibrate this remote sensing uh, approach. So please, uh, I'll take any yield data you, you can offer. Yeah, Stephanie, if you have the answer, <laughs> if you have the, the uh, yield data, I just think sounds like Mike will take it. Uh, Pam has a question, which is, I think, a good one to mention for ACPF too, is clarifying the geographic range of the tool and if there's any limitations to using the tool across a diverse range of landscapes. And Jessica, I might um, have you answer that too for the ACPF, because I know the ACPF could potentially work on all landscapes, but maybe, you know, it's, it definitely has its Iowa mark on it in terms of the Midwest and some of the conservation uh, practices we use and terms we use, I know as well, that aren't always common. But Mark, I'll go to you first. Yeah, great question. So all, all the data is farmer input. Uh, the NHD layer is national, it's, and the soils, uh, we used to use the Sergo layer when we had soil-specific county rental rates. We no longer have soil-specific county rental rates. We now have county-specific soil rental rates in the Farm Bill when that changed. So there is no geographic limitation. It's any agricultural land in the U.S., um, and we don't check that they meet the farming requir history requirements for CRP. Right? We assume the user is going to if it's a farm bill biologist or any of y'all, if you're, you have to be farmed four out of the six years within that farm bill cycle. Uh, so no, there's no, there's no limitation geographically because everything is either farmer input or, or, you know, a national database, like the, like we have the sole rental rates in there, they get updated every farm bill. They're supposed to get updated every two years. They don't always. Um, so that was, there was, that was the first part. And then what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. 
just any uh, limitations when using it across diverse range of landscapes or range of range of crop commodities too. Yeah, th there aren't really any limitations on that end because, like I said, yield data is yield data. If the yield data is quality yield data, it goes. It, it's kind of like any. Yeah. any mathematical function what my calculus teacher used to say was crap in equals crap out right so if you give it bad yield data you're going to get a very uncertain result and so we ask we 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 try to get you know calibrated yield data from yield after we know we're using it well um and we try to um with the yield data if you ever get a hold of any it's very uh dirty I should say there's lots of errors in it so we have a cleaning process that we go through that's now I didn't show that but you can when you plug in your yield data and we, we have a, a cleaning algorithm we've put into it where you can uh, you can you can say, OK, look, in, in my part of the world, the highest corn yield should ever be as this and the lowest is this. And it'll actually take out the outliers and then it'll clean it anything within three standard deviations of the mean of the yield data you give it. Um, and that's a standard kind of yield monitoring approach that most of the, the precision ag people do. But yield potential in Iowa is probably a lot higher than yield potential in the black period of Mississippi, right? Like if we cut 135 bushels to the acre of non-irrigated land here, you know, we're going to get rich. Um, Y'all probably would, 135 is, you know, is probably something to laugh at in, in Iowa. So if you input that, when you clean it, when you input in the tool, you would set your own min and max. And the reason we do that is we don't want to, we want to, we want to remove errors in the data, yield data, but we don't want to remove true low values, right? So that we, we let the user input that to make sure it's, it's, it's a, it's based off your potential of your crop in your region. Um, and then there'll be gaps in the, in the point data, which is yield data. And then it has a, a, a inverse distance weighting algorithm. It smooths it and, it does an interpolation, uh, but usually, and like sometimes the header's not full, right? And if the header's not, the, the combine header's not full, it's going to show lower yield than what it assumes being the header full. We try to account for that through the interpolation process, but um, those are things we really can't control. We've just tried to mitigate them so we don't, we don't make too many grand assumptions. Great, thanks. Yeah, Jessica, to you in terms of like the the geographic range for the ACPF. Yeah, um, so it was developed in Iowa, so a lot of the conservation practices that are the structural ones that are cited from ACPF are kind of tailored to our landscape, and so tile drainage, um, and then also is kind of unusual in other parts of the world, and then um, like water and sediment control basins or Kerosene might not be so applicable in areas kind of in the Delta or like Mississippi. We've run ACPF there before and we're pretty limited. Um, we're looking at a watershed that had a lot of rice production. And so it's just a different kind of cropping system. So it's kind of geared towards um, corn and bean right now. And there's talk about ways to advance and kind of enhance it for the entire nation. I'm working with NRCS on that. And then like the financial tool right now is just tailored. Um, there's one for Minnesota and one for Iowa. And then they're working in other states that have um, crop productivity indices available. Some of the NCCPI information, um, we're trying to figure out how to work with that data set. And there's been some limitations around that. And so I see you smiling. <laughs> Mark, I don't know if you yeah. that data set. Well, I'm, I've always been jealous of y'all's suitability index. We don't have that. And you look at all the cool stuff that uh, Iowa Soybean Association and David Muth and Brandies and all those guys published up there. It was really cool. We don't have that here. I've tried the NCCPI and, it, you know, it, it has its limits. It, it, you know, it's very attractive, but it's not it's not exactly I had a whole grad student work on it and it's cool. But uh, yeah, y'all have got. If every state, hey, any states, do what they're doing. Iowa has figured out how to map soil productivity better than any state I know. So please uh, uh, teach Mississippi how to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I was just putting a few links into the chat, so I'll put those there for folks in terms of where they can find the recording to this. Um, the ACPF website, as well as maybe that link to the watershed data in terms of where we currently have watershed data for the ACPF. And you can kind of see that mid Midwest region, um, not that you can't create your own uh, watershed 
data there. Um, so we only have one minute left, but I want to ask real quick Brandon's question of when would the MSU precision conservation tool will be available? I'm wondering, Mark, I know it's not available now, but you were hoping at the end of the year. I'm wondering if it's something where you could let us know so we can distribute it to this, this list of folks when it is available. No, well, don't worry. Everybody's going to hear about it. When <laughs> we finally get this thing off my plate. This is why wildlife biologists should never develop software. We It's way out of our realm. Um, uh, the only thing we were waiting on was a way to lock the source code so somebody couldn't right. just take it and then put a timer on it because I wanted to give it away and the campus lawyers wouldn't let me. And they said that I, I had to sell it for something because every time the farm bill updates, I have to pay a coder to, to update the language. And um, so it's going to be a, a fairly reasonable annual fee. Uh, they just sent me a new way. We, we The first way we tried to lock the software was very clunky. And um, this new way is supposed to be much better. Uh, again, I should have just, they should have hired a computer science person instead of me. But uh, anyway, yes, I will let everyone know my Twitter, my email, I'll send it to y'all, everybody. It, it will be, I'll be screaming at the, at the top of my lungs to, to finally get this thing out in the world. Wonderful, wonderful. We appreciate that. And we'll be sure to share it with the North Central Region Water Network uh, list here to let folks know that that tool is available. Um, I know there are a few questions in the, the Q&A that we're not able to get answered there, so I wanted to throw up Jessica and Mark's email. If you have a burning question that you weren't able to get answered, feel free to reach out to them directly uh, with that, and you can also uh, post the recording to this uh, website, this uh, webinar on our screen here, so you can make sure to watch that or rewatch it for any questions that uh, you may have missed. That'll be available at northcentralwater.org. I also want to let folks know we actually have a webinar next Wednesday as well on cover crop profitability. That's from our Soil Health Nexus team, and they are going to be uh, talking with uh, Rob Meyer out of the University of Missouri and uh, in see Sarah about the cover crop profitability. Um, so make sure to register for that. Thank you so much to Mark and Jess for taking some time out here today. And thanks everyone for joining us for this edition of the current webinar. Thank you. all Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great rest of your day.